Welcome to the Growth Pulse Podcast, where we take a deep dive in the world of business, business sales. Your hosts, Daniel Bartels and Simon Peterson, talk to some of the world's leading salespeople, sales leaders, experts in sales technology, and thought leaders in today's best sales skills and techniques. From the Growth Pulse team, please welcome your hosts, Daniel Bartels and Simon Peterson. Hey, Simon. Hey, hey Dan, how are you? I'm Happy really Monday. well. Happy Monday. I am uh, excited for our first podcast. <laughs> yeah, me too. Lots of lots of uh, conversations and planning. Finally, it's uh, it's going. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've we've talked about this for such a long time, uh, and it's it's nice to actually have a, a little bit of time and and a bit of breathing space to to jump in and actually put out put our Conversations into action. Yeah, we've had, uh, what, six, seven years of chatting about uh, all things sales, and it's nice to um, finally get it out there and uh, share it. Let's see what people say. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting, um, you know, have, having a bit of time. I think, you know, we've both looked around. There's not a heck of a lot of people chatting about this in, in the Australian context, and I think, uh, you know, lots of uh, American insights, and I think... Um, and people in this country and New Zealand as well um, will certainly be uh, interested in a little bit of the local flavour. It's, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of things that are similar to um, selling wherever you are in the world, but there's a lot of unique yep. things about the context in, in the market we work in. I think that's certainly yep. uh, something that people find interesting. Yeah, for sure. I think it's um, and one of the things that you and I talked about for a long time in working for an Australian, working in an Australian context, typically for North Americans or overseas overseas firms, um, which is very common, particularly if working tech um, or or even biotech or other bits and pieces. Now, um, is you know we often have to do so much more with less. Uh, we often have to be a master of so many more skills um, and you know have less resources than what our colleagues have overseas, and that's a that's a, a factor of our like the size of our businesses and the size of our markets and, and, and you know, rate of growth and all those types of things. Um, but I think it's an interesting piece for people either coming into sales um, or trying to sort of ramp their career up or get to the next stage uh, or really just just bed them down to be more successful. Like how do you, how do you be a master of so many different areas um, whereas typically I think overseas you can really focus on, you know, just one particular sector or one particular skill, you know, just be an enterprise rep or just be strategic. Um, I think, you know, the key for salespeople and sales leaders in, in, in our side of the world is you'd have to be a master of all these different areas. I think you do. And I think, you know, we've, we've worked for American businesses where, for example, the marketing function sits squarely in uh, headquarters and, and I think both you and I have yeah. certainly had to become uh, field marketers, uh, events planners, all sorts of things. And I think um, it certainly gives the average Australian salesperson, business leader, sales leader, a lot broader experience in terms of what makes a successful sales team, what makes a successful tech business in this market. You, you do tend to have to touch on a lot of things. And I think the other, the other interesting piece is, as you mentioned, the size of our market. It's obviously uh, an order of magnitude smaller than um, the US, for example, but um, working in a small market means you know mm. everybody. Um, you know, I think um, you know, working in the industry for almost 30 years, the, the, the number of people you know in different tech spaces, outside of tech, in marketing, et cetera, um, you, know, you, you can't afford to put a foot wrong. Um, like uh, because everybody knows you, um, but the flip side yeah. is you can certainly lean on um, your network incredibly well. You, you you always know somebody that knows somebody in a prospect, for example. Absolutely, I think I think you're right. I mean, networking becomes so critically important for not only your success. So you know you you can get a roll on um, so much faster, um, but I mean your you know, the impact of your failures or uh, your inability to focus on the outcomes of others around you is found out really quickly. Um, you know, you and I have experienced that where, you know, we've, we've turned around a company 
Yeah. We've turned around a company really quickly by focusing on relationships and how do we build credibility um, and, and ensuring that those around us are succeeding as well. Uh, because we'd seen the, the impact of you know, partners, um, whether it be other software companies or delivery partners, dropping the ball. And, you know, as a result of that, you know, the rumour mill runs rife. And, and you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always reminded, and I think I've said to you a hundred times, Australia's a big country town. And, and I think the world, yeah. I think, you know, really the business world is a big country town as well. I mean, I'm, I'm never surprised how close someone is actually to, to my LinkedIn profile in terms of, you know, they're only, they're only really one or two connections away. Um, and your reputation does always yep. precede you both good and bad. 100%. And, and not all of it is uh, valid, but um, you've got to look after it, right? Reputation hey, is, people's is perception. Yeah, people's perceptions are their realities, right? Um, and sometimes we don't like that and we want their perception to be different, but that's the, <laughs> that's the piece we've got to change. Yeah. And I think in sales, I mean, that's, that's the piece in sales that we, we go to, to edit for people on a regular, on a regular basis, what their perception is of either what problem we can solve or what their problem is and what needs to be solved. I mean, that, that really is what our, what our roles yeah. are. So, I mean, I yeah, want to ask you, obviously we spent a lot of time. Also, oh, go. go no, I was going to say, um, you know, I think it's quite interesting, obviously working in an Australian subsidiary of American or European uh, companies. It's, um, you know, the other really, really important thing is to look beyond uh, our shores. I think, um, you know, working with um, you know, American software company, there are uh, a lot of people uh, dotted around the world that absolutely love to lean in and help uh, the Australian business or the satellite business of a, a global company. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, in, in our experience, uh, you know, very early days um, with Financial Force, as, as an example, um, we identified those, you know, key players in the US and the UK that absolutely love to lean in and help us. And that was a huge help to our growth. And you'd, you'd get uh, visits from various executives or thought leaders. And I think mm. that made a big difference to us as well. So, so you know, that tapping your network in, in Australia and New Zealand is critical, but understanding, um, you know, who around the globe um, yeah. understands the market or wants to understand the market, leans in and helps us. It's, it's, it's great. And I think to that point, it's it's not just even the, the network inside the business that you're in at the moment it's who is the network of people you've worked with before yeah. um you know who are you finding either out of the last event you went to or you know the the colleagues of your colleagues yeah. like i think that building that network is something yep. that's critical um and i know you and i talked about this uh, you know as the as we were developing the concept for, for this podcast and these conversations that succeeding in in long-term sales is like you, you have to get the, the individual sale right. And so many of the sort of the sales gurus and people coaching out there will focus on a particular singular skill. And, and all of that stuff's so necessary. But to but to succeed in the long term in business to business sales in particular, there are so many other skills you've got to get right. Um, it's more than yep. just being good at the gab, so to speak. You know, it, it really is about how do you oh, so how much. do you manage a territory and how do you manage a territory plan and how do you um you know how do you focus on the right accounts at the right time? Uh how do you do the forecast? Like all these things roll into what what does a great sales person salesperson do and a sales leader do. Yeah. And, and it evolves over time. I think uh, what was a good forecast uh, approach 12, 18 months ago yeah. may not necessarily be the right one. So you, you're continually looking to evolve and improve the way you do it. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we've talked a lot about sort of uh, the, the, how we got here, but you know, what, what are you hoping that um, both we and our listeners and, and people who join the join the podcast as guests will, will get out of this experience? What do you, what do you think, Simon? Um, well, like from, from my perspective, there, there are a couple of things. I think first and foremost, uh, for me, it's a, it's a great opportunity to talk about uh, the last 30 years I've had in the industry and uh, reflect on what I've learned. Um, you know, I've had uh, all sorts of different uh, bosses and leaders, some that I would love to emulate, some that I would do pretty much anything not to emulate, um, and how I can bring those sort of um, experiences uh, in context to help others 
backwards. And I think, you know, you've got a, um, you know, generation of sales leaders that are probably a good 10, 15 years younger than I am. Um, you've got salespeople early in their careers. Um, and I think the ability to give back, have a good conversation about what's worked for me personally, uh, what hasn't worked, what I've learned over that. I, I'm really excited to talk a little bit about that. I think the other piece for me is uh, my own journey, uh, continuing to learn. I think some of the people that we've spoken to that we will get as guests on the podcast are going to give amazing insights. And, you know, I continue to learn and grow and understand and, and get better at what I do just by chatting to people that have done things before. And that doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm talking to people older than me. Um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll have some conversations with some you know, wonderful people that are sort of late 30s, early 40s, late 20s that have figured things out that I just haven't done yet. And so I'm looking forward to learning uh, from that perspective. Um, and I guess the last piece is um, I think, you know, people listening to this podcast may be um, inspired and motivated to do things differently, uh, make a difference. And I think uh, for us, um, the, the ability to um, coach, mentor and help organisations help individuals uh, off the back of some of these conversations is going to be fantastic. Ritz, I'm really looking forward to it. So, Dan, yeah. yourself, obviously, uh, you're a big part of this podcast as well. What are, what are, you, what are your <laughs> thoughts? What are you hoping to get out of it? Yeah, look, uh, so, similar to you, I mean, uh, throughout my sales career, I mean, I've, you know, I've had a sort of a wide and varied sales career. I've, I've done a, a number of different things and, and really found my my uh, my home in in business to business technology sales in particular, but I think the the thing over my journey that's been really enjoyable has been talking to people about how you solve problems and how do you you know get out of your own way sometimes in a deal. It's so easy to look at um, you know the, the roadblocks um, or the challenges or the reasons why you can't succeed. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the best times that I've had is where uh, I've had yourself and a number of other colleagues, um, uh, Dan Lodge, I know he's going to join the podcast shortly, and, and Vic McDonald, I think she'll do the same. We've sat in rooms with whiteboards and people who know me will, will, will joke at me in a whiteboard, but just writing up all the problems and how we're going to resolve them and how do we solve them. And I think it's that um, self-reflective part of, hey, you know, what do I need to do to succeed? Uh, what do I need to do to learn? Um, to your point, how can I lean on somebody else's knowledge to make myself just that 1% better tomorrow than what it is today? Um, how can I refocus yep. even what I'm doing today on back on the customer? And sometimes it's that colleague of yours, it's that other person that says, hey, you're, you're more focused on closing your deal than solving a problem for your customer. Is, mm -hmm. is that what's going to get you there? And, and to your point, it's having those consistent yeah. conversations. And, and the piece that, that doesn't, that has really struck me um, with, it's not a chord, but it's a, um, it's made me recognize as we've given ourselves all this flexibility over the last couple of years, whether it's been you know, intended or, or, or uh, driven to us through COVID, that we spend so much more time working from home or working without our colleagues mm -hmm. where you would grab a coffee and sit in a room and have a chat and, and learn all these things organically. And I think, um, I, you know, I see, you know, you, you and I've talked about, I would hate to be someone joining a sales business today or early in my sales career and not be able to have these, these water cooler conversations. Uh, and, and I think mm. this podcast can provide a lot of that sort of knowledge to people to really think about what their own craft is. Um, you know, yeah. I, I think that's, that's... And motivate them to get back to the office. Well, whether it's back to the office or whether it's how, like, how do you learn? And I think all these things about how we're going to learn is changing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I heard a stat the other day yeah. that apparently there were more, during the two years of COVID lockdowns, there were more um, online education or just across the board education generated in that two-year period than, than had ever been created previously so it doubled and then it doubled wow. again in terms of total content created doesn't mean it's been consumed it's not been created yeah absolutely so uh, and of course it's driven because we're all locked from home and but how do people start to have 
conversations about learning because I know I've learned so much more through conversation than I have through doing a course or, or you know mm. filling out a form etc so I think that there's some of the things that that you know drive, drive me to kind of have these conversations and same as you I mean how do I talk to a whole bunch of leaders to just understand what they're doing um, widen my own, or own horizons mm. like I think that's that's a huge opportunity as well um, up down sideways yep. different industries I think all those things are, are relevant. Um, you know, I'm I'm never surprised where I can make where I can learn lessons in terms of what does good sales or what does good customer focus look like. Yep, yep. And I think um, you know it's going to be fascinating. Some of the guests we're going to have on the podcast because we're going to get a yeah. lot of really interesting and different views on things. And you know, I think it's important yeah. that um, people listening to this don't just get get the Dan and Simon perspective. Um, yes, yeah. we've got a bunch of experience, I think, uh, but between, between us, about 50 years, uh, which is <laughs> a very scary statistic. To Disconcerting. <laughs> but uh, it is, it is. Um, there's, there's, there's a reason why I'm wearing a hat for this uh, first uh, podcast. Uh, there's not a whole lot going on on top. <laughs> we should get hats made up, hats so we can cover our... Well, I'm balding yeah. and... and... <laughs> I'm, I'm already there. You're already there. <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, I think, uh, but I think the, um, look, the other thing is um, it needs to be entertaining. People need to have a good laugh at themselves, a good laugh at Absolutely. us. Um, you know, as I, as I always say, um, selling software is hard. Um, yes, you get rewarded for it, but, but it's a bumpy ride. It's like a roller coaster. Um, and, um, you know, it's hard work. So you, you've got to have some fun along the way. And if you're not enjoying yourself, you're probably in the wrong role or you're probably yeah. going about it completely the wrong way. Um, yeah. you know, I think um, there is nothing better as a salesperson when you close out that really big deal, you nail it, but you do it from the perspective of uh, you become incredibly close to your prospect, you become you know, possibly not family with them, but the next step out from that yeah. because you, you're you really helping them and their business achieve something. And uh, to, be, to be honest with you, there is nothing better than that. And you know, as we both know, as a salesperson, um, when, you, when you close that deal, you know, all the internal accolades happen because you've delivered on, on what you said to the, the business that you yeah. work for. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, you know, the real journey is just about to start for your customer. And you, know, you, you sell some software, then they need to go, go ahead and implement and realize all of the benefits that you've been talking to them about. And, and that journey has just begun. So there's nothing like that, uh, that time when you're ready to really make a difference for a prospect. Yeah, I think I, mean, I, I agree with that, that, that context. And sales are one of the few careers where you fail more than you win. And it's maybe you compare. I like to compare it to sports people, right? But I mean, if you're if you're a sports person who loses more often than you than you win, then often you, you don't make the top grade. Um, but no. but I mean, sales sales is probably the only career. And if you think about most other careers, if you if you're a doctor and and, and your patients come in and die more than they live, like you don't last very long, right? Um, you know, if you're only if you're if you're a True. builder. And and if I build the houses, but I, but most of the houses that I build fall down, you don't survive. Whereas if you're a salesperson, the reality is most of the engagements that you have don't get to a successful sale. Um, and either you qualify out, they qualify out. But I mean, that's kind of part of the way that this works, and it means that the wins are so much sweeter. Yeah. Um, but it's also why it does. Um, yeah, you know, a good a good colleague of ours. Um, she used to say all the time, you know, hey, I'm I'm happy for my happy for my colleagues to to take a fifty percent cut or put fifty percent of their uh their uh their comp on risk. If not, I mean, there are lots of lots of sales industries out there where it's a hundred percent of your of your compensation is basically at risk on a on a constant basis. Um, but that's also Absolutely. where they can make you know life changing money and 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 personally, I think it's 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 a life changing experience actually being a salesperson long term. Um, so yeah, yep. So Simon, um, absolutely. Look, but I, but we, I, I think. Um, go. On. <laughs> uh, so I was going to say, um, you know, it's um, you, you don't win all the time, as you as you quite rightly said, Dan. And I think you know, it's um, listening to people that are doing it to make those, as you said, one percent improvements. Um, you know, most deals you go into as you walk in the door, 
you've got about a 30% chance of winning that piece of business. Yeah. Um, there might be three, you know, you've got uh, two other competitors looking for that same piece of business. Um, so the more you can do to focus on how you get slightly better, improve your odds, 1%, 1%, yeah. 1%, 1%, um, you, you, you turn that one in three win rate into one in two win rate into, you know, yeah. you start to get a lot better. And then that makes a massive, massive difference. Yeah, it does. And I think, Simon, you know, it's, uh, I actually heard um, a guy called Jeremy Miner, who I've been watching a whole lot recently, is a, a, a great sales trainer and he's had a phenomenal sales career. One of the things I, I heard him say the other day is sales is not a numbers game. And I think it's a really interesting point of view. Yes, there's the 30% win rates and all mm. this, you know, the more you eat that up. Mm. But the way you eat that up is not just by doing more. The way you eat that up is by... Is by ah learning more and being more successful and and being more skillful at what it is you do um you know i know that was one of the one of the uh the the pieces that, that we surprised our colleagues at financial force around when we were there at you know we were we were, we were achieving two or three x at some stages the win rate of our global colleagues and they just kept saying how are you doing this mm -hmm. and it was the effort we were putting into our mm -hmm. team around look how do you how do you win more how do you focus on the right conversations to have and the right the right um, internally and externally. Like what's next in this deal? How do you plan better for that? How do you prepare better for that session? How do you work better with your colleagues? How do you work better with your with your coaches at the customer or you know find the find the the, the right pathway to, to close this particular deal so that the customers are thankful for you taking them through this process at the end. And I think that concept it's not a numbers game. It's a skills game. Uh, and the best salespeople you see, yep. you, you're in awe of their skill. Yeah, there's a lot of psychology in it as well. Absolutely. So, look, uh, you know, I, I know for this, in, this initial podcast, we wanted to just give everyone a, a, a brief background so they know who we are as well. Um, so, Simon, look, you know, give us a, the, the, the 10 cent tour of kind of your, your background and, 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 where you've, and what's brought you to today. Yep. Okay, well, um, thanks, Dan. Um, look, I've been in the software business for about thirty years, which is really, really scary. I um, I left I left um, uh, high school and did a uh, computer science degree at, at New South Wales Uni, which was interesting. That was back in the uh, the early nineties, and I remember turning up to university one day and someone showed me a web browser. Um, so that, that's as far back as I go. Um, I, I did a lot of programming uh, in that computer science degree. And then uh, happily, um, this is really interesting how a career kind of pans out. You, you finish your, your university or whatever you're doing to, to study after school. And um, I remember my dad uh, came to me and said, look, um, I'd like you to stop painting houses. I think you should probably use that computer science degree of yours. Um, I've, I found an ad in the paper for uh, a job. Uh, they want to hire some graduates. I went, okay, I'll go do that. Um, and that was uh, when I joined uh, SAP as a, as a graduate. I started uh, as a programmer um, and very quickly realized that there was always going to be a, a slightly better programmer sitting next to me. So I, I jumped into the world of uh, consulting and spent a good 10 years uh, implementing SAP at some of Australia's largest businesses. I loved it. Um, funnily enough, you know, on, the, on the theme of learning and, and understanding your craft, I was surrounded by some really awesome people that taught me all about uh, accounting and cost accounting and project management, and that's what I consulted in for 10 years. Uh, loved it. Um, I then uh, lived and worked overseas. I was in uh, Canada and Germany and had a wonderful time over there. Um, I guess the focus of that was all around um, uh, value engineering and value selling. So that's really when I got my first sort of taste around, you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve? How valuable is it to the client you're trying to pitch your solution? Um, I had a wonderful time. And my, my son was actually born uh, in Canada, we then moved to Germany, um, and I ended up over my period at SAP spending about uh, 19 years there, which was uh, longer than I think most people would contemplate a career at a company, but um, it was just such an awesome place to work, um, learn so much, had a great time. Um, in the back end of my uh, time at uh, SAP was in operations, so I ran uh, the, the sales operations business in, in Australia and New Zealand for about four or five years. Um, and that gave me an enormous understanding of 
the mechanics of how you build a sales team, the mechanics of how you set territories and quotas. And um, I, I'm almost ashamed to say I got very, very good at Excel spreadsheets, um, you know, learn, learn a lot about numbers and how you roll them up and build a business plan. So that was fun. Um, but then um, it was an interesting time, actually. I, I really needed to get into the, the SaaS space. Um, I think, you know, on-premise software was doing well, but I, um, I really felt the market was moving more towards uh, SaaS. So I had an enormous opportunity to go and work at Salesforce, which is obviously where we, where we met. Yeah. Um, and I then spent, you know, three and a half years uh, working at Salesforce. I'd, um, I'm sure there'll be another podcast to talk about some of those experiences, but um, yeah. <laughs> look, I, it, it was an incredible, um, an incredible journey learning how to sell software for as a service, learning how to work at an American company after so long working at a, a German or a European company, very, very different. And um, you know, I think as, as we jump into some of the topics later on, um, the difference in leadership style from your typical American company to a typical yeah. European company is, is very, very different. Um, and as, a, as an employee of both, you've really got to learn the subtleties of um when to stick your head above, above the parapet, when not to, and really understand that they're, they're fundamentally different psyches to run a software company. Um, and then um, and then I moved into Financial Force. Um, had a great time there. I, I always described my first day at Financial Force as a very interesting one. Um, I had a, uh, a salesperson and a uh, consulting person probably about to hit, get to blows on my first day. That was uh, a really interesting cultural experience, to be honest. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, you came into Financial Force and over the next six or so years, we, we grew that business enormously and learned a hell of a lot. And I'm sure there's um, some stuff we can talk about that down the track. So, you know, that's, that's my background. A lot, of, a lot of consulting, a lot of operations, a lot of sales leadership. Um, learned, you know, to work in an American, American company, I learned to work in a German company, um, and, and yeah, more recently working on the um, the data backup recovery side of SaaS software was fascinating as well, and just uh, really interesting. So, you know, as I jump into w- whatever comes next, I think reflecting on you know, what I've experienced over that thirty year period is is going to be good fun and good fodder for a, a podcast, I think. Um, so that's, that's me. That's where I come from. Um, so, Dan, how about yourself, mate? Yeah, so look, I've, I've spent my entire working career in sales and, and I don't think it was part of the original plan, but it's kind of where I landed. So um, I, uh, I started in sales right out of school. So the very first thing I sold was mobile phones. Um, I, uh, of all things, I got, I got sick in year 12 and actually split my year 12 over two years. And so I was sort of half available for half the time. Um, and, you know, worked in a, in a number of different mobile phone, um, uh, agencies, uh, over, over time. I made good money. Um, at the time we actually made good money selling mobile phones. Um, spent a bit of time working for a marketing agency, um, sort of running teams for them to so really learn the, the other side of, um, the, uh, what a go-to-market and uh, and the way that you you bring leads in um, that was interesting. So sort of worked worked in my, was on the Clemenger agencies and then stepped down to to retail channel sales. So I spent uh, a couple of years. Uh, I ran some sales teams for Nikon cameras um, and then for Hasbro toys in Australia as well. And then took a bit of a sidestep. So while I was at um, uh, Nikon and Hasbro, I, I'd completed my MBA and um, I. Dad and I both, uh, my father and I are both uh, MBAs from Macquarie, and he's a solicitor. And every now and again, he throws me a brief and says, "This isn't a legal problem; it's a it's a business problem." What do you think this is? And uh, we actually ended up buying off one of his one of his um, clients. We we bought the uh, assets of a appliance company that's about to go into receivership, um, and we turned it into a, a national kitchen laundry appliance repair company. And um, we then, on the on the back of that, we built out their their retail business, their their sales business, and their their parts business. But that's kind of where I stumbled into SaaS. Uh, I really quickly had to work out how did I, how I was going to run this agency that where I had sort of one hundred and fifty odd um, uh, independent contractors around the country. I had a contact center. I had a high velocity of transactions and. I had to bootstrap. Um, you know, we, we didn't have VC funding or anything fancy that we sort of see people get the, get these days, um, despite despite trying. Um, I had to bootstrap this business <laughs> and, and 
re really learned how to sort of run a, a, techno a technology infrastructure as the the founder. I mean, look, my title said CEO, but but I'm not quite sure that's, that's what I was, but anyway. Um, and that sort of, you know, I, I ended up doing a lot of sort of um, customer reference, uh, a couple of videos, things for Salesforce. Um, and, you know, one of the one of the leaders there, um, a guy called Tony Armfield, um, joked to me one day, said, um, look, what? you know more about this than half my sales guys do. Why aren't you working for me? I said, well, when I sell my company, that's what we'll do. And um, a couple of years later, I got some advice when we, I was never my long-term, lifelong dream to run an appliance repair company. When we were going to sell the company, I, I fired myself, put in a, a manager um, and uh, took a role at Salesforce. And uh, sort of that's what started my sales career. So I spent sort of five years at Salesforce, worked through their their marketing products, uh, what became the marketing cloud, then worked with you in the uh, in the core business um, to their, their core CRM business for everybody out there. Um, and then um, came across and joined you at Financial Force and moved across there. So, you know, we spent five years at Financial Force and, you know, I, I led the, the sales team there, which was which was amazing. Um, probably the best part of my my working career to date. Um, and uh, from there, stepped across into a, a regional leadership role. So, so ran another software company in the in the uh, a company called Conga in the uh, rev revenue operations space. Um, and uh, sort of now looking for the, for the next step in terms of of where do I go to from here? But you know, I've had a career in career in sales um, of all types of sales, and you know, selling individual service contracts for someone needing with a broken dishwasher handle, and how do I get that resolved? Selling multi-million dollar contracts, um, you know, long term to some really complex organizations, um, to selling high velocity sales um, software. Um, my original sort of uh, engagement at Salesforce were sort of month on month contracts because that's what the, the marketing agencies demanded. So, you know, real, real mix of, of what do you focus on, what do you do, but everything has been around if it doesn't provide a solution to you or the customer's customer, it's just not happening. Um, and and, the, and yep. I think the one thing that I've and that's the, that I've, I've really focused on over time is if this is not going to be commercially viable, or just if it doesn't produce outcomes for both parties, this is not going to happen. And let's not waste our time. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. That's a theme we'll uh, touch on quite a lot. Yeah. You know, what's the problem you're trying to solve, and is it mutually yeah. beneficial for us to work together? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Simon, I think that's a reasonable intro to everybody about sort of what, what the podcast is going to be, who we are. Um, you know, I know we've yep. uh, we've got some exciting in interviews coming up, um, both with each other, but all, but also um, with a number of guests we've got lined up. So um, maybe we can wrap it up there. And uh, I look forward to chatting chat to you and, and everybody else again soon. Me too. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thanks, Simon.